Okay, so um, uh, where did we get the last time? Which is the last things we did? Uh, somebody has the notes? Huh? Klein Gordon equation. We wrote it down explicitly. Okay, so um, basically um, what we did uh, last time is um, we know that there is this uh, relation between uh, um, the momentum and the energy and the, you know, the various component. Then we promoted this to be operator. And uh, um, this um, operator for us is the dx mu. So this, if you want, is a definition. Then this is an operator relation that is i h d d d x mu square <coughs> d d x mu applied on something because this is a differential operator so we apply on a sort of wave function I mean a sort of wave function I said because uh, it looks like a wave function but there are several stringent limit uh, if we want to give a one particle interpretation to this I told you the other time that we cannot in relativistic uh, quantum mechanics, we cannot localize a particle at a distance less than the Compton wavelength, otherwise it starts producing many other particles. And uh, <clears throat> second, uh, that um, as there is a, always a space-time relation between one and the other, we have also a limit uh, on delta t. So uh, <clears throat> that means um, we, we, we should keep those things in mind if we want to interpret these as um, uh, a system describing a, a one particle relation. So now if you work out it explicitly, you get the following things. Uh, keep account of the i, keep account of the various sign, and the final result is this, 1 over c squared, the second derivative respect to t2, the second derivative x squared, Okay, so if you want, I mean, people can often ask, where do you derive that equation? This is not really a derivation. Okay, we postulate that equation like we postulate the Schrodinger equation. Also, the Schrodinger equation is not derived. Um, what we have to show is that um, the solution the, of this equation describes some physical um, system. And in particular, what we will do now, we will see that uh, if we uh, <coughs> look uh, at the free particle, so you see there is no potential here, there is only the mass. If we uh, take solution of the following form, exponential minus i h p mu x mu, this is equal exponential minus i h bar p0 x0 minus p times x, this is the space part, and this is equal exponential i h bar p times x minus e times t. You see that from this plane wave solution, the c has disappeared, and it has disappeared because <clears throat> you know, P0, let's remember here, P0 was E over C, and X0 was C over T. 
So when you multiply p0 x0, you get that c disappears. This is a, an important thing. Now, let's see if this, that is a plane wave, you know, it has the usual form of non-relativistic plane wave. Let's see if, so this is, when you do um, also Schrodinger equation, you take solution of this form. Let's see if they are solution, okay? You remember that these are solution in the Schrodinger equation if p square over 2m is equal e. Let's see here if there are solution always or p and d are constrained. When plug that in, okay, so plug that in and do all the um, various derivatives. And what you get um, is the following things from here. You get e square over c square minus p square uh, minus m0 square c square psi equals zero. Okay, so this derivative, second derivative, pulls down from there this expression. So you see that is a, sol that is, um, a solution if this is identically satisfied. But this has that form and is not identically zero, this psi xt. So to p0, this part has to be zero. That means a square over c square minus p square must be equal to m square c square. Maybe I lost something, no. So that means a plane wave a plane wave is a solution of the free klein gordon equation only if the energy and the momentum satisfy this um, uh, mass shell relation. Now, <clears throat> let us look a little bit at this uh, in more detail and let's um, um, see, uh, let's solve it and let's see, for example, how many energy we have given a momentum and a mass, how many energy we have. Well, it's easy to solve this. E is equal plus minus m square c square plus p square. So, there are two energy associated to each momentum, while in the normal relativistic case, what did you say? Right, uh, C. In the non relativistic case, you remember that E has a particular form that is p square over 2m. And uh, so there is only one solution. Given a momentum, there is only one energy. Here there are two. And let's see how they are. And the reason there are two is because, you know, differently than in the Schrodinger equation, here there is a second derivative. While the Schrodinger equation has only first derivative, if you remember. And this is very important and this crucial and this all the matter. Uh, now, as there are two um, solutions, let's start, for example, with the lowest momentum, p equals zero. And let's see how they are made. Well, they are made in this manner. This is the zero things. And then here we have m zero square c square, or actually, uh, there is something wrong. C fourth. Now, let me, sorry. Um, I bring on the other side, so I get this. I have put outside, uh, then here, and then it, when it goes in, it goes, okay. So now, <coughs> if you look, the energy is like that, is above this threshold and is below this threshold. So it's something like if this system describe, uh, could describe system with negative energy. Um, we will not uh, use this um, interpretation. Even if this is what appears, we will go through it and see, give a different interpretation, even if the energy here is negative. And um, uh, so we have to give an interpretation to this. And this was all um, that um, 
um, the problem that arose when uh, Klein and Gordon proposed this equation. Immediately, they realized there were negative energy. And usually, negative energy are something that you don't like because negative energy are associated generally with potential energy and not uh, with, here there is no potential. And um, second, there was uh, negative mass and so on. So they tried uh, to give a different interpretation. But there are further problems, not only the energy interpretation. Now we will see that the usual probability interpretation is uh, as problem. The usual probability interpretation, you know, in quantum mechanics was that the Psi modulo square can be interpreted as probability density. And of course, the probability density is always positive. Now, let's see here if we, um, if this has, uh, can have a meaning as probability density. Now, let me cancel. So, <coughs> trouble with the probability interpretation. Now, we will. Remember that tomorrow is the last day for the first set of homework. I mean, they are few and easy, and also in the second part, they were few and easy, so I'll... Um, okay, so let's write... Uh, okay. Uh, let's write the equation as we had before in this uh, abstract form. And let's do the complex conjugate. These are Hermitian, these operators so they don't change, equals zero. Now let's do the following. Let's multiply this first equation by psi star and the second equation by psi and then subtract the two. What you get is uh, psi, yes? Oh, yes. Um, let's um, subtract the two and we have uh, psi p mu, p mu minus m zero square c square psi minus psi P mu, P mu, okay, so these are the two equations, one I obtain as the complex conjugate of the other, I multiply the first one by Psi star, the second by Psi, and I subtract, it's the same things you do with, um, uh, in the Schrodinger case, to derive the, um, uh, the continuity equation between the probability density and the, the current density, you remember that things, okay. So now if you replace um, uh, P mu, yes, P mu with uh, this operator with I H D D X mu, then the, this equation leads to the following equation minus psi star h square the mu the mu plus mc square psi plus psi there is some no the sign are right i mean i factor out an overall minus one because here doing the square i get a minus with this minus it compensates so h square So this is the gradient, the symbol for the gradient, okay? And um, this one, if you, uh, <coughs> you see this piece cancel with this piece, and if you neglect the h square, you get the following equation, the mu psi star, the mu psi minus psi, the mu psi star equals zero. And these can be written as a d mu j mu, where j mu is equal i h to m zero 
psi star. Now you can say, how did you get this factor? I got this, fa I put in by n this factor. You see, from this, uh, I can get this with a factor in front. There is no, why I put this factor in front that does not appear there? In order to give to this, especially the zero component, the meaning of probability density. Okay. Okay. And the meaning of probability density, it means that if you take J0 and look at this dimension, the dimension is 1 over a length cube, okay, with this factor in front. Yes? Current density, yes. The J mu? The complex sign, the denominator. Oh. Well, this book used the definition, if I'm not wrong, with the plus. I mean, um, you agree that this object. Uh, this object is this, so it has an I in the numerator, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you put, you know, I mean, it has an I in the, you see I have added all these P's, H over 2M, okay, please. The? Yeah, in fact, now we will go and see which is the zero component. Okay, you see, this is the conservation law, and this is a four divergence equation. Now we will go and do the um, two component. Let's uh, do in components, okay? Let's do these in components, and let's see what comes out. It means let's specify the mu. What we get is the following. Remember, x0 is ct. So take account of all factor of c, and you get ddt i h bar 2m0 c square psi star d psi dt minus psi d psi star dt plus plus then I have the space part, because here it contains d0, d0, and then di, di. Okay? So I have the space part that is a divergence of what? Minus i over h to m0 psi star. This is the normal space divergence equals 0. So this equation in component is this, keeping account of all things. And then you can write this as d rho dt plus divergence of a tree current. See, this is the four divergence. This is the three divergence. I put a vector above it. And now let's look at the various rho. Rho is equal, yes? The index is up. But this, uh, oh, you mean I put the index above if you want, yes. But what I meant with the index down, it meant uh, the uh, following, then the index goes up. The reason I put the index down here is not that the index is down, is I meant this, and then it goes up, the index. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you, I mean, it depends which is the, so I call this object, I call this object I H D D X mu, and then I know that the index goes up, so if you prefer that manner, let's write that manner, okay, it's just a problem of convention. Uh, I, 
Um, I like that you, all of you, are careful to this position of the index and so on, but I hope you don't miss the big substance of the problems, okay? Because I will not uh, penalize you in the final exam if an index is up, an index is down, or plus or minus. I penalize you if I understand that you don't grasp the physics, okay? So don't waste much time on this. I don't myself waste much time and uh, it might seem sloppy, but I care that, you know, you don't look at this detail and grasp the physics. And now here there is a piece of physics that is extremely important. That is one of the most important of the beginning of last century. Okay, so let me write down the H. And the current is this. Now, from this relation, we immediately derive that the total charge is conserved. So let me cancel this. Did you manage to find the book with no problem? Okay. I will tell you which part we do. We will not do all the book. And uh, even in the Kling Gordon uh, equation, we will only do some sections. So now we are uh, basically doing, um, um, well, the, we are basically around page uh, uh, 10, 11, something like that. But I will tell you which section we will skip. Now, uh, from here, it's easy to derive the usual conservation law. How you do? Well, you integrate over d3x. And uh, with over all volumes, so volume, all volume of the system at infinity. Here you use Green theorem and says, well, this is equivalent to the integral over all the surface of J multiplied D sigma, okay? And um, this is made of um, wave function that we suppose are normalized. So at infinity, they go to zero, okay? Modulo those who are like the... Um, three waves, but uh, okay, this is zero, and then this object is basically d d t d three x rho is equal zero, so the total, this is the total probability density, is the total probability, sorry, and this conserves. So this, uh, con this is called continuity equation, And it leads to a conserved quantity, it is the total probability. But what is more important is that we look at this. Look at the expression. The expression is quite different from the one we used to have in non relativistic classical mechanics. If you remember, the non relativistic, the non -relativistic one was psi star psi, and it had the meaning of probability density. And the real meaning of probability density because it's positive and the total probability is positive. But here there is this uh, minus sign. Not only there is this minus sign, um, you see it is a second order equation, the um, Klein Gordon equation. So you have to specify the value of the wave function and the value of the derivative as you like at the initial time. That means those two. The wave function and the derivative are arbitrary. If they are arbitrary, I can cook up things so that this quantity is negative. Okay? And then uh, the interpretation of probability density is in trouble. So that is the most important thing. I mean, people have worked so hard in uh, non relativistic quantum mechanics to associate to psi, to the wave function, some meaning. We know the meaning is probability density. In the non-relativistic things, everything fits because uh, 
this is positive and second all the experiment fits with uh, the fact that this is a probability density but here I have a problem if I interpret this this quantity is conserved this quantity is conserved I call it uh, the total probability and this is the probability density but uh, there is a problem in giving that interpretation this quantity can be negative okay so uh, if they tell you which is the main problem with the klein gordon equation, the main problem with the klein gordon equation is not the two energy, that the fact that there is a negative energy. We will interpret that in a different manner and we will fix uh, that uh, things um, with no problem. What is really a problem is that we cannot give a probability interpretation to the continuity equation that we derive from the... Con from the um, uh, to the temporal part of the continuity equation, this row, we cannot give a probability interpretation. And then, of course, you know, is a very, um, this is a very um, troublesome thing. And uh, why <coughs> uh, all this is related to the fact that the klein gordon equation was a second order uh, equation in T. And then we, we have to give, as initial time, the derivative with respect to t. And we are free to give anything we want. Because we, as it is second order in t, we have to give psi, psi, and we have to give the derivative. So Dirac, for example, started working and saying, uh, maybe there are other relativistic kind of equation that are first order in t. And that is what Dirac did. And we will uh, go later on to the Dirac equation. Now, the first things that we will do is, uh, as it is being postulated, this equation, well, we know that the free wave satisfy that equation provided P and D have the usual mass energy relation. But the first things that people start worrying when they realize that there was not a probability interpretation is, as the klein gordon equation, the correct non-relativistic limit, well, it has. And now we will per go through and perform those calculations. So let's see if the uh, klein gordon that was postulated, so it might be a wrong equation, because it is for sure Lorentz uh, covariant, because you know it has the right um, um, the Lambertian, the for the Lambertian means we could have written it in this manner. And this is Lorentz covariant because this is just, uh, <coughs> you know, the x mu, the x mu, so it's Lorentz uh, invariant. And, um, but as we have trouble with the probability density interpretation, as it the correct limit, it might be that it does not, it does not have the correct uh, um, non-relativistic limit. So, so the first thing is trouble with the probability interpretation. Uh, the second, let's see if we have, um, well, I can cancel now, I think. You have understood. Now, uh, let's uh, work out what is the non-relativistic limit. Sorry? Yes. So what's zero? I mean, what's the optimal solution for, for this problem? Oh, we will see which is the solution with this problem, that basically we will not interpret this as probability density, but as charge density. And then the klein gordon can describe particle with both positive and negative charge. OK, that is what uh, will turn out to be. But let's first work out a non-relativistic limit. Well, um, let's uh, um, to work it out uh, better, you know, in a particle that is relativistic, there is a huge mass, a huge energy in the mass part. And then there is some kinetic energy that usually, uh, if the particle is relativistic, it can be uh, as much kinetic energy as mass energy. But if it is non-relativistic, the kinetic energy is smaller than the mass energy. So let's parameterize a generic solution in this manner. I can always do. Means nobody forbids me to parameterize the solution in this manner. 
okay? That means I have taken out, this is a complex number, I have taken out a phase that is this, okay? I can always do, this is, if you want, this is the definition of this, given, given a generic things, and writing it in this manner, it means this is the definition of phi. Phi r of t is nothing else than psi exponential i over h m0 c squared t. So there is nothing, I am not restricting my solution writing them in this manner. This you can interpret as a definition of phi. Phi is like that. Okay, so I am not doing this, I am not restricting my solution to be of some particular form. Now the other thing is, mm, yes? R? R, yes. Now, um, let's define the following quantity. The total energy of the system minus mc squared, m0 c squared. This is a sort of the kinetic energy. And as we are working, uh, we say no relativistic limit, so that means uh, the particle is not going at the speed of light, it's going at a much lower speed. So the kinetic energy is much smaller than the mass energy. So this one, that is the kinetic energy, this is the total energy. We subtract the mass energy. This is the sort of kinetic energy. The hypothesis that we make is this. This now is... Um, um, the no relativistic limit. So the no relativistic limit means for me, um, because you know I don't have velocity here explicitly in the equation, I have the energy in the equation. So for me, no relativistic limit, it means the kinetic energy, is the total energy minus the mass energy, is less, much less than the mass um, energy. You know, who control the kinetic energy? This piece, because you know, when I do the derivative with respect to time of this, I get the energy somehow, the kinetic energy, right? The DDT goes like E. So as I factor out the uh, mass energy, I have only this part, so this part will go according to these things. That means uh, IH, d phi dt should go as e prime phi. But this means, because e prime is much less than m0 squared, that this is much less than that. You understand, this is sort of uh, not rigorous things, but uh, just to um, uh, help you understand. The derivative with respect to t is always goes as the total energy, okay, when you do the um, relation uh, um, uh, between uh, this operator and the corresponding uh, thing. So here I have factor, and is this psi. Here I have factor out already the mass energy. So this object will go only with the kinetic energy. So I expect that it will go like this. Okay, and this is much less than this number. So let's keep this in mind. And now Let's, so let's keep this in mind. And now let's go on with this, doing the derivative with respect to t and the derivative with respect to x and so on. In the, um, uh, remember in this, in the, Well, let's put everything to one, uh, and c to one, so we have something like that. This is the equation. So we have to do the second derivative. Now, from this, we would like to see if we go and end up in the Schrodinger equation. Let's see if this happens. Now, <clears throat> let's start and do the first derivative. So we have to do the second derivative. Let's do the um, first derivative of this object. So d psi dt is equal d phi dt minus e m0 c square h phi 
exponential minus i h m0 c square t. Up to here <coughs> is very easy. What I did, I did the derivative with respect to t of these. I got this term multiplied by is exponential. And then I did the derivative of this with respect to t, and I got down this piece multiplied by all the rest. OK. Now, let's do the derivative one more time. Well, first of all, uh, let's remember that this piece, according to the non-relativistic limit, is much smaller than this piece, OK, modulo factor of h. So that means this piece is much smaller than that piece, OK? So here, if I want to be this piece from here, from the non-relativistic limit, is much smaller than the other piece. Forget about the h bar that was in the denominator. It was there. So basically, this quantity is basically minus i m square c square h phi 0 exponential minus i h m 0 c square t. OK, if you want to apply immediately the um, um, OK, let's uh, you understand this point. So here, this object is much smaller than this, so I could keep just this, and it would be OK. But let's proceed with the second derivative. The second derivative is d dt d phi dt minus e m square c square h phi exponential minus e h m zero c square t. OK, so we apply the derivative to all these. Now let's see what we get. But now we start making some approximation. Um, first of all, this object, we bring down the, let me write the result, and then we will discuss it. Now, this piece comes from this derivative. This piece comes from the derivative of this. And why it comes from the derivative of this? Because somehow I have neglected this. Remember that this object is equivalent to this, is approximately equivalent to this. So. If you neglect it, you get this, the derivative of this, this object plus the exponential. Then I have the derivative of this, OK? I have the derivative of this that multiply all this quantity. You can say, and it is this piece. You can say, basically, you have neglected a second derivative. Yes, if the first derivative is much smaller than this quantity. If I do a second derivative, here I get a first derivative that is also smaller than this, and so the second derivative I neglected. So here, if you want, I have neglected the second derivative, because if I do from here, the second derivative of 5 with respect to t will be much smaller than mc squared d phi dt. But this, on the other side, is much smaller using this than this, and so on and so forth. So I neglected the second order derivative. Now, let's see 
what I get from here. Uh, let's sum these things up. You see that you have two things that are equal, and then you have this extra piece. So here I have minus i to m0 square over h d phi dt plus m0 square c fourth over h phi exponential minus i over h m0 c square t. Okay, now let me go on this side. Okay. Now, just a moment, because we can see. Now, let's rewrite this last piece. I should have 1 over c square e to m0 c square over h d phi dt plus m0 square c square h square phi exponential minus e over h m0 c square t. Okay. Now let's remember which was the, let's remember which was the, um, okay. Uh, let's remember the original equation. Okay, and uh, let's insert in the original equation the expression we had, uh, the expression we had for psi, that psi r of t was phi r of t exponential minus i h m zero c of t. Okay, now. What did you say? Why did I put the 1 over c squared? To cancel now, let's see. mc squared, mc squared. I just multiplied by this overall factor. I just multiplied by this overall factor because I need in the next step. I can always do multiply by a factor. I need in the next step. Let me remember now how we do the next step. So I have first order derivative. Uh, oh, just a moment, okay, because I think in my note I wrote it the wrong manner. Just a moment, please. Yes. Now, what did you say? So, there is a one of the squares in the equation that you... No, I am looking at this... Um, I am looking at this right-hand side. Okay, and then I insert a 1 over c square, so I have a, a 1 over c square also here. You see, remember, this is the second order derivative. This is the second order derivative. No, but I calculated this quantity. Now I multiply this quantity by a 1 over c square.
but you can always have a c square here, you know. I mean, it depends how you look at the equation. Don't be so rigid. I mean, if you look at the equation, uh, look at the clean gordon equation, okay? Let's look at the clean gordon equation. And in the clean gordon equation, if you have the book, is 122. Is 1 over c squared, the second derivative respect to t squared, minus the Laplacian square, the spatial Laplacian. C squared T squared, T square. That is the uh, that is the but that is the Klein Gordon equation, you know, because uh, the Klein Gordon equation we wrote in this manner. Okay, and here we have, and this one. This is uh, this is C T. You understand? So that is the reason. I don't like to get out of the mainstream, you know. I understand your yeah. point. No, no, we have, because the question that we, all, we want to solve is this one. So yeah, no, yeah. but the one I wrote there, I said, let's put C to 1. That oh, one C I wrote, one. that oh. one I wrote there, I said, let's uh, put C to 1. You know, uh, mm, let me uh, give you a criteria because I think, uh, I mean, as you are a student, you are, uh, uh, as I said, you have to understand the substance of the things. That means the core of the things. That is very important. If you keep saying, oh, there there is a C, there there is a minus one, you know, you don't get the core at the end. At the end, you can go back and redo the calculation and fix the C. But it is important that you get to the core of the, impo of the things. That's, uh, I mean, I insist on that because otherwise I keep getting interrupted and I keep, uh, that's fine that you fix a C, a minus, and so on and so forth. But, you know, then uh, you lose the main uh, things. It's like uh, having somebody making a speech and saying, oh, but there you have to put a comma. And he's doing a speech, so, okay, I put a comma. And, you know, fine, he's fine, that, but it's just the, um, um, I want to get to the main result. Then you go back at home or I go back and you, at the end, so I would prefer that, that you keep and don't interrupt till I get to the end. Then you can say, why there is a C there? Why there is, you understand, this is just a, a matter of communication between me and you, otherwise we lose the thing. Now, here uh, we have over 1 over t squared. I put a 1 over c squared, so I have a 1 over c squared. Here, minus 1 over c squared, minus 1 over c squared. I have added. Then I use, now, as on the left-hand side, I have a second derivative. I use this equation. So, basically, all this quantity, all this quantity that we have obtained, is minus 1 over c squared, the second derivative of psi with respect to t squared. Okay. Let's use now the full, um, the full um, uh, equation. That means now I replace this with the uh, space part because I have the Klein Gordon, so I replace this with the space part. And then look what I get. So here, I replace with the space part, that means it's something like this, okay? Plus the mass term, uh, there is put C equal to 1, put the correct sign, and so on and so forth. So I replace this with what the Klein Gordon equation tells me. And the result that you get is uh, there is a part here with the mass that cancels exactly this part. And you are left with this second derivative and the first derivative. You understand the point, OK? So I've started with this. Now here, for this, I use the Klein Gordon equation minus m squared, c squared, or let's put c equal to 1, psi, and so on. Use this, and then what you get is actually there is something get canceled is a plus, but there is a minus. So if there is a minus, it gets a plus, it cancels with this. So this part cancels with this, and you are left only with the space part and this. So summarizing, you understand that, that this is the important things to grasp, that I have um, used here and here. I have used 
the relativistic limit. The relativistic limit tells me that d phi dt is much less than m square c square phi m, c, m zero c square phi. Okay, and this is the relativistic limit. And there is an h bar and so on, but it doesn't matter. So what I replace this with this spatial part, and I do because I use the klein gordon equation, there is an extra term that cancels with this, what you are left with, the space part and the time part. You collect all of them and you get 1 over h d phi dt. Also, this part gets cancelled because there is a factor in front equal minus h square over 2m0. Then you have this part that is d second dx square plus d second dy square plus d second dz square phi. And this is the usual. Schrodinger equation for phi. You see? You can say, oh, but it's not the Schrodinger equation for psi. Yes, but you know, we have factorized psi in this manner. Psi equal phi exponential i minus m0 c squared t. That means we have factorized the part that is really the mass part that is the relativistic one, and we got the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so this c square cancel with this c square, you see. Uh, then uh, uh, this c square, here I have an m square, c square, h square that cancel with this piece where there were the, all the h square. I have used the klein gordon equation. So what is left is only this piece that is this. Okay. Okay, so that is the correct relativistic limit. Now this, if you want all the proper uh, factor, is um, what we have done is uh, page seven, okay, is page seven of, uh, and eight of the book, okay? Now, um, one can say this particle and this equation that we got, so this is the non-relativistic limit, and this is the Schrodinger equation. This one, does it describe a particle with width feature? It's a particle with mass m0 and spin 0. You remember that if you want to describe in the non-relativistic limit a spin one half particle, you need uh, the Pauli equation. You have done the Pauli equation, I imagine, in quantum mechanics. And the Pauli equation has two, um, as a, is a wave function, is a couple of wave functions. Remember, the Pauli equation is written in this manner and is an equation for uh, uh, two components. Here we have only one component, so for sure this describes a spin zero particle. So we got the non relativistic limit of a spin zero particle. Did we do something about the spin above? No. So also the Klein Gordon is for a spin zero particle. Okay? We did not do any manipulation uh, on the Klein Gordon except taking account of the non relativistic limit. Why I'm telling you this? I'm telling you this because sometimes people say that the spin is a relativistic effect. You find some old book where there is written these uh, wrong things. It's not absolutely. The Klein Gordon is a relativistic equation, but it describes spin zero particles. So the spin, uh, they have the, in mind that because the equation that is used most is the Dirac equation, and we will see that the Dirac equation describes spin one half particle. Okay, so if you find in some book the statement the spin is a relativistic effect, they refer to the Dirac equation that we will do later on, but uh, up to now, um, the Klein Gordon describe uh, um, um, describe a spin zero particle. Now uh, let's uh, do one thing, and um, uh, let's go back to the now. Okay, so the free. I mean, why the Klein Gordon? We can somehow say it's not a wrong equation. 
uh, is not a wrong equation because it's not a relativistic limit, it's exactly the um, um, Schrodinger equation. So somehow it is okay. It has the problem of the, interpret the probability interpretation fails. Now, <clears throat> and so that is a big problem. Let's work on that a little bit and let's uh, um, go back to the free wave solution. Okay, if you remember, so the non relativistic limit is done. So let's go back to the free wave. The equation was this. And zero, and P mu is I H D D X mu, where X zero is C T. Okay, so that here there is a C, and when you do the square, there is a one over C square in the denominator. Now uh, we have seen that uh, um, psi with some normalizing factor exponential minus I H p mu x mu, and uh, we use the Einstein convection that when the two indices are crossed, it means sum. Uh, this one, if we write in component, is exponent, exponential, 1 over h bar p times x minus e t. And why see this? Sorry. Uh, why C disappear is because P0, P0 is E over C, and so C cancel. Okay? Now, we know that for this solution, this free wave solution, to be, for this free wave to be a solution of this, P and D have to satisfy the usual energy relation and uh, mass energy relation that was the following e square equals c square p square plus m square c square okay that is the same as uh, i have brought on the other side for this simple reason so this is a solution of this equation only if e and p satisfy this relation and then if you take the which given p and this is the three-dimensional P, okay? A given P, which is the energy, then the energy associated to some P can be of two type, plus and minus C, M square, P, P square, okay? So the solution, as there are two energy, remember, this is a solution only if E is not a generic E, but is EP the one that is solution of this equation. Then there are two solutions, plus and minus equal exponential i over h p times x minus e, and here there is plus and minus, so let's put this is e p plus and minus, e p plus and minus t. So you see that there are two solutions. Now let's go back and uh, see what happened to the probability density. If you remember the, what we call probability density, even if it had uh, no meaning uh, of probability density. Okay, let's go back to the probability density. Okay, the probability density was rho i h to m0 c square psi star d psi dt minus psi d psi dt. Now let's suppose that our particle, that the particle we described with mass m has a charge and let's then introduce a different object that is rho prime that is the probability density multiplied by the charge. Okay, so E is the charge. 
Then, of course, you have the analog also, the current density. Now with E is E, E, H bar, 2N0, Psi star, Psi minus Psi, Psi star. And now this is not a probability density, um, this is not a probability density, but is a charge density. Because I have multiplied by E, if I interpret that as a probability density, even if there were a problem, multiplying by E, I have the charge density, and this is the current. The charge, current density. Then, you know, things might now get fixed. Why? Because as these new quantity are really charge density, it means, as it can be positive or negative, that this um, Klein-Gordon solution might uh, just be either a positive or a negative uh, charge density. Uh, that means it can be, it can describe either a positive or a negative um, charge particle. Um, let me tell you what is eventually the things you will do. You see, the psi, you know, it is, it looks like a wave function, but you can interpret also as a field. When you did electromagnetic, when you did electromagnetism and introduced the mu, XT field. What is a field? A field, after all, is some um, function of X and T. And also, this is a function of X and T. So you can interpret the wave function as a field, as a particular field. And you know, the fact that um, usually is interpreted as um, um, the charge is interpreted as a probability amplitude. Um, it was good in non-relativistic uh, mechanics, but uh, here we have already trouble. So it's much better to interpret the psi of the Klein-Gordon as a field. And this is a sort of classical equation in the sense that this is a field, but we have not quantized this field. Okay, we have quantized x and p and got this momentum, but we have not quantized psi. So we can say that this is a classical equation for this field that we have not quantized. Psi, we have not quantized. Okay, let's now go back to the, uh, given this interpretation as a charge density, let's go and see here we have two solutions. Let's go and do the following uh, things. Let's uh, insert this solution uh, this solution, let's insert into here. It means we take for psi plus and psi minus and insert. And what we get is, uh, of course, as we are two solution, we will get two rho. We get a plus and minus equal plus and minus E, EP modulus over M square C square, Psi plus minus star, C plus minus. Note now we have put in the um, free waves, just a particular solution. But on that particular solution, you see this is positive, and uh, if this now is a charge, it is plus for the psi plus solution is a plus charge. Okay, so this is a, a, a charge density, but it's a positive plus charge density, and for the minus is a negative charge density. Okay, just do this simple calculation. It's very simple to take that expression and put it here. So um, we can now give a different interpretation. Psi plus as a free wave describe a, char describe a particle that has plus charge, plus one, plus E. The minus, the psi minus, describe a particle that has minus um, charge minus E, you see from there, because the probability density is really positive, because this quantity is positive, but the one associated with the psi plus has a plus here, so it's a positive charge. 
interacting. So these two solutions, at least for the free waves, describe particles with different charges. And uh, we don't have to go back anymore and say, oh, well, in the Klein Gordon, <coughs> we have positive and negative energy, where the negative energy was uh, a particle with a negative mass is something very strange. Dirac tried to give an interpretation, but uh, it was not really much accepted. So it's much better to have uh, this. The, the Klein Gordon field describe system that can have plus or minus, um, uh, so that means the raw as a, is not ambiguous quantity anymore, at least for the free waves is not an ambiguous quantity because it's either positive, negative, definite or negative, definite. And uh, having put, this is a different object, we have multiplied by this quantity. Now the question that you can ask is, okay, well, let's do things um, uh, precisely and let's calculate the normalizing factor A. To, yes. No charge, okay. The, I, am, I was getting to that point. You know, uh, you get uh, things with, with charge zero if psi is real. You see, if psi is real, this is zero, right? So or you get, uh, you cook up a solution uh, that is real. How do you do? You sum C uh, plus with uh, psi minus and get a cosine or a sine, and that is a real quantity. Okay, so linear combination of these produce a particle with charge zero. So it can describe also system with charge zero. Now let's, please. Right. Right, okay. I mean, for sure, the Klein Gordon describe a particle with mass m with spin zero, okay? But nobody forbids us to say that, let's suppose that the uh, psi can have associated a charge. Let's suppose, that means, and then we see that it can have a, prove a positive charge and a negative charge. I mean, we are just saying, that when I made the things about that is a field, don't associate anymore, like in, with, the, with the Schrodinger equation, that psi is associated to a particle, no? Psi is a field now, okay? So if it is a field, that field can have different charges. It can be, you know, for example, this one has no charge at all. The Klein-Gordon field, uh, mm, we say that it can have a charge, but it can be both positive and negative. Okay, so it, then we can say, look, the um, Klein-Gordon equation can describe both positive charge uh, particle, negative charge particle, but also zero charge particle. So it has the room, because of these uh, plus and minus, it has the room to get another quantum number into it, okay? That is the charge. And um, that, that, does it that answer your question? Yeah, you see, the point is this. Um, you will understand these things very carefully much more carefully than these, uh, mm, when you do the what is called second quantization that you will do next year. The second quantization means that this that is a field get quantized. You can say, what does it mean that uh, the wave function gets quantized? No, no, look at it as a field. You know, when you do the point particle, the analog of this is Q and P, right? Q and P are the analog of the field. Okay, so as we quantize these, turning them into operator, we can quantize these, turning them into operator. And the same we will do. You will see when you do second quantization, you turn the wave function into an operator. Okay? And then, if you turn into an operator, you see that then this equation does not describe only one particle, but it describes many particles. A system of many particles that can be either positively charged, negatively charged, or even uh, neutral, okay? In fact, if you remember, I told you, this description does not allow you to describe, uh, if you stick with single particle interpretation, then uh, you have to stay, the localization length 
is at most a Compton wavelength. If you want to go below, so that means the delta x is less than the Compton wavelength. If you want to go at the slower, the, at the, um, uh, if you want to increase uh, the resolution, then what will happen, you have to give more energy, and then you will create E plus, E minus couple, okay? Uh, and the other day I explained a little bit. You see then, it means that actually this system, if you want to have a resolution at any scale, not just at the Compton length scale, has to describe something that contains more than one particle like coupled pairs and so on and so forth. And the right framework is second quantization. But we will not go into that uh, for the moment. Um, not, not in this course, OK? Yes? For now, I'm familiar with the charge and the spin. And I saw it describes charge and spin. Is there another thing, like interesting, another thing like, um, yeah, OK, other than charge and spin that, that describes why? Uh, well, yes, there are, um, no, for the klein gordon equation there are not, but uh, <clears throat> you can have, uh, you know, uh, this is the wave function. Without putting anything, we know that it's mass, it has mass, spin zero, um, charge. You can have other quantum numbers, like, for example, uh, um, isotopic spin and so on and so forth. Then what you do, you put a label here, A. It means one wave function describe uh, a system with some quantum numbers like, uh, um, uh, for example, isotopic spin. You will uh, see what is isotopic spin. Maybe you have done in some courses. Um, for example, um, the proton and the neutron belong to a doublet uh, on which one has isotopic spin one and the other has isotopic spin zero. So there are other quantum numbers. But to get them in, you need to put a label. So as we have not put any label, then there are just the three basic things, mass and energy, uh, momentum, we know, uh, spin, uh, we have not put uh, indicated anything, so it's spin zero, and charge. So if we don't put any label, these are the three features that it can have. But if we want extra number, then we have to put a label. OK, now let's uh, do, um, um, here we have two solutions. So we should put two coefficients, a plus and a minus. And let's see now if we uh, can get it, if we can calculate it like we did with the Schrodinger equation. So it's a very simple thing. What we do is we work in a box. Instead of working on all the space, we work in a box. OK, so this is x, y, z. Let's work in a box with side L. OK, and um, let's calculate A plus using the normalization. Of course, I mean, uh, um, or if you don't want to use normalization, let's remember that drop prime was the charge density. So if I integrate, and I have told you, one has a positive plus uh, charge density, the other has minus. Uh, so if I want the total charge, I integrate the probability density over all, and I know that it can be plus or minus E. That means not it can be. I impose, as this at the meaning of probability density, I impose that when I integrate over all the volume, I get the total charge, and that charge, the smallest unit of charge is the charge of the electron. Uh, so I Impose. This is my normalization condition. Now, why I cannot do any more rho d3x equal 1? Because this has not the meaning of probability density. 
So the normalization condition for the claim Gordon are this. Now, I don't know in the final exam, but I might put uh, in, um, beside a couple of problems or whatever, some minor question like uh, this is one that um, um, I might put, which is the normalization condition for the claim Gordon equation in a box. And everybody says psi, psi star equal one. No, because psi, psi star does not have the meaning of probability density. The normalization condition is this. The only object that makes sense is the charge density. Then the integration of the charge density over the volume has to be the charge. And the charge we have seen can be plus and minus E. So, um, yes. Yeah, but uh, we can get it out of these two. We can get as linear combination. You know, if this is a solution, if this is a solution, also linear combination are solution. Though, so we can get a linear combination of a charge plus with a charge minus, and the overall wave function describe a particle with charge zero. Okay. So now I am normalizing these, and these are exponential, not sine or cosine, so they are not real, so they have charges, this one. Okay, now, uh, as we are inside the box, we know that the wave function we want, we are inside the box with infinite wall somehow, so that means we want that the wave function goes to zero on the wall, and then this tells me that the P, you know, remember, we want that this psi plus psi minus is zero on the three walls, on the six walls that there are. And then what you get is that Pn as a vector is 2 pi over L n, and n are triplet of integer number nx, ny, nz. This is the analog in three dimension. <laughs> This is the analog in three dimension of the usual quantization on the momentum because I want that at time t equals zero, so I put zero. I want that in zero, in L, and so on, uh, this is uh, zero, and then it has Pn has to be an integer like this. Okay, then immediately you get which is E. E is from here and it depends on P. So uh, you get that Pn is equal C plus minus Pn square plus M zero C square. Okay. Okay. And this is equal plus minus C and then 2 pi L. Okay, so you see that also E is labeled by integer, this set of um, integer. Okay, now let's put this expression and this expression inside here. So now we have a Pn and we have a Epn. Okay, and also this is labeled by N. And now as integration over the volume, the volume, you know, is L cube. We have to put in the expression of rho. So let's put in the expression of rho that we had. I don't want to rewrite it anymore. And then uh, we get the following things. L cube D3x rho plus minus x. What does it mean rho plus minus? I put in either the solution plus or the solution minus, and I impose that is equal to E plus. Now, Rho is made of psi and the derivative of psi, and I know here. So now this expression, the only things that uh, I have are the integer. And if you do this calculation, you get plus minus E, E P, M zero C square, A N plus minus 
modulo square L cube, it must be equal to 1 plus E, and from here you get the normalizing factor. You get the normalizing factor a m plus minus r equal to n square c square l cube e p n. So they are the same for plus and minus. Okay, and the wave function having obtained, so you understood how we obtained the normalizing factor. Okay, I did not do all the calculation, otherwise, I will have. Now, from here, I get uh, the solution. The solution of this form. Now, I put in this expression m0 c square l cube e p n exponential i over h bar p n times x minus plus e n times t. So the difference, note the difference here, is only in this uh, object that there is a plus and a minus because the energy can be plus or minus, okay? So the only difference in the two solutions, the coefficient in front, the normalizing factor is the same. This is the same. The only difference is here. So the plus and minus of the two charges is reflected here. Now, in general, now I can do linear combination of them. Uh, let me cancel it uh, somewhere. Okay. Let's cancel here. Yes. Yes, basically I uh, remain in general with a plus minus and then I prove that actually they are the same. The A plus and the A minus are the same. No. I proved that they are the same. Yes. Okay, but, uh, in the no, in the exponent here, there is a plus and minus. I forgot. There is a plus. Is, uh, minus there was, in fact, minus for the usual one. And then if you change sign, you get plus. I mean, the usual things without uh, looking at the sign of E, is minus ET, is PX minus ET, okay? Then if you get a negative things, uh, you get a plus, because negative energy Now, <clears throat> as it is a linear equation, you see the Klein-Gordon is a linear equation. Linear, it means what? That psi enter with the first power. And in fact, psi enter with the first power on the klein gordon equation. There is no term like lambda or g psi square. There is only first power, so it's linear. Then if it is linear, you can have linear combination of the solution that there are still solution. So for example, you can have uh, psi plus combination n r psi n plus, where these are arbitrary coefficient, and you can get a n. Then we know the form of this m zero c square l cube e p exponential i over h p n plus x minus E P N times T. You can do linear combination of the Psi minus. Let's call the coefficient B N. Historically, they are called B N. This, remember, where the normalizing coefficient Now, as uh, to answer his question, these are all object, linear combination of objects that have all charge plus. These are linear combination of objects that have all charge uh, minus. But of course, I can do psi plus, psi plus, minus, psi minus. And here I would get something combining 
the two basic, the two most basic one, for example, n and n with the same n, okay, without summing over any coefficient, I get something, if I do the sum uh, of two, I get something that goes like the cosine. And then this object, this phi is real. Phi star is the same. Okay, then this as, uh, is real. Then if it is real, remember the drop prime is proportional to phi star d phi d psi dt minus phi d psi star d phi star dt. Then if it is real, this is charge zero. So you see there is the possibility of describing particle with charge plus, charge minus, and charge zero. A typical example of a particle with spin zero that come with three different charges is the pion. The pion is a spin zero particle. These three roughly have the same mass, so they can be described by the same equation roughly because there are corrections, but they are due to strong interaction. And uh, we don't care about that. Um, so for example, Yes. No, <clears throat> okay, uh, you see this depends on n. So this is the uh, probability, this an is the probability amplitude to find some particle with charge plus, but with some quantum number n. That means one wave or another wave, and the same here, okay? so. So, for example, a system that is described by the Klein-Gordon equation, at least at the free level, is this. They have spin zero, mass different from zero, and they have three charges, plus, minus, and zero as charge. So this is a typical example described by um, the relativistic um, um, uh, Clean Gordon equation. Now we will now don't have time tomorrow. The charge one we will concentrate on the charge one where psi is complex, and uh, we will see to divide into a real and imaginary part what happened and so on and so forth. We will play a little bit more. Not tomorrow, Thursday. Um, we'll play a little bit more with this. Of course, you know, uh, in this book there is much more than what we will effectively do, but I prefer to have a book um, that we follow uh, so that uh, there is no complaint about the notes or anything. But we will do much less than what is in this book because it's basically impossible. After uh, we will do a little bit more on the Klein Gordon, then we will go to the Dirac equation, it is the one that is much more used. Uh, because this guy spin one half particle and uh, okay.